All right. So really, really, really excited about the conversation we're going to have today. We have an amazing serial entrepreneur uh, joining us. Um, so for those of you who are watching the recording, you know, please let us know in the chat. Uh, those of you who are joining us live, we're really excited to have you. You know, if you have any questions for this amazing serial entrepreneur, you're welcome to go ahead and use the Q&A. If uh, you put it in the chat, we might lose it. So please make sure that you use the Q&A if you have any questions. Uh, so for those of you who are joining us, my name is Ikria. I also respond to Aqua and Akua. I am one of the directors at the Founders Institute Ghana. And just before we start off, I just want to remind everyone that the deadline for enrollment, if you want to join us this fall, is August 21st. Um, and the cool thing about what we have um, this year is that founders can actually pay in installments. So there are lots of different opportunities, you know, financially, if you want to join us, especially if, you know, the financial component of joining us is an issue. The cohort does start on August 30th. It's about an 18 week uh, program. I think it's such a great program, but it will take about 20 to 35 hours uh, per week if you do join us. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. You're also welcome to reach out directly to Rashid as well. So now that that's out of the way, let's actually get into the conversation that we're having this evening. And I'm really, really excited about this conversation because prior to even jumping on live, we were having a little conversation about what success is, right? How do we define success? Because the title of this conversation is How My Startup is Succeeding in Africa. So it is my pleasure. I am so excited uh, to introduce Sam. Uh, Sam, can you just take a second maybe to introduce yourself uh, for those who are joining and those who are watching the recording? Hi, um, Ikea, thank you very much um, for having me. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction. Um, it's always a pleasure to speak to you because um, in a lot of ways, I remember when I used to live in Ghana, and I think a very long time ago, I'd reach out when you started consulting, uh, you know, back then, um, and to be able to see how your own journey has kind of progressed and you become more and more part of the fabric of like the, the ecosystem that you've always wanted to, uh, to build. So it's, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. Um, my name is Sam Badu. Um, I am a founder and CEO of Flurry. Um, Flurry is a company that helps immigrants living in the diaspora ensure that the money that they're spending on their families back home um, goes exactly where they need it to, right? Starting with healthcare. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we do that. I'm pretty sure a lot of you know that um, part of the challenges of uh, this money transfer um, era that we live in is the fact that, you know, not only is it costly to send money uh, just as cash, but also um, there's a lot of misuse, abuse, um, and misspend of the funds that are sent home. And as we all contend with, you know, the possibilities of a recession, it becomes really, really important for immigrants who tend to work a lot harder, but also not have as many of the opportunities as uh, they would like to have their funds used more efficiently. After all, they work so hard for it. Um, and that journey has been uh, close to two years now uh, that we've been on. Um, and as, as you would come to, to learn, uh, we started our pilot in Ghana. Um, you know, just recently we got into our fifth country. So we now support, you know, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and not officially announced yet, but we just locked in um, Kenya with, with our new partners, right? Um, serving the diaspora from those countries to help ensure that their families are doing well um, while they themselves um, are also able to protect their resources. Uh, amazing. Absolutely amazing. And congratulations on getting into more markets. I think that's absolutely incredible, especially since every single country probably has different policies, different ideas of how this is meant to look. Uh, but before we dive a little bit deeper, actually, into you know, your startup and some of the things you've been able to do with that, I'd love actually to ask, what is your definition of success, right? How, how are you thinking about success these days? And has that definition evolved since you launched? 
Uh, uh, this is a tricky one, right? And I'll try not to like uh, BS you. Um, when you start out, like the vision of success that you you see, and I'm speaking in my own uh, sense, is like to be in a place where you know I have more options and more say over those options, right? Um, and that's kind of the journey that um, I'm, I'm on, right? Uh, every single day, every single month, um, I have more and more control over you know, where I'm going to be, where my time is going to be spent. Um, and I can see that like tangibly, right? Um, and so success for me is the ability to build a life that has more options, right? Rather than uh, fewer options and fewer decisions over several aspects of your life. Um, success for uh, the company is the world where we're able to see tangible impact from the things that we're doing on a daily basis, right? And, and I could go into that later, into what that could actually look like or what that looks like. I absolutely love that answer. And what I think is so unique about it is that you've actually given us, right, there's two parts to this, right? Recognizing that you are a human being that's separate from your business. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes for founders, right, those two sort of end up becoming one and the same. And so the fact that you see it in these two different buckets, I think is really, really interesting. And I also think that this is a great segue to maybe tell us, you know, the story of your startup, you know, why did you start it? And I also would love for you to share the, the I guess the little story that you shared earlier on about sort of the impact that, that your startup has had. Yeah, so, you know, you, you grow up hearing that necessity is the mother of invention and um, for every single person uh, that creates, um, there's always a very personal part of what you're creating um, and the need for it to exist in the world, right? So uh, very similarly, um, I grew up in Ghana, like a lot of the people who are uh, watching or listening. Um, I had a great time growing up um, in Ghana and enjoyed a lot of different things while I was there. Um, but about eight years ago, I decided that um, I wanted a different kind of life. I wanted the opportunity to be able to do uh, something different and bigger, right? Um, I'd gone out of Ghana in 2008, uh, lived in Morocco for a good while, came back in 2012, I believe, and um, spent time uh, being a part of and building um, a few businesses, right? So I started a company called um, you know, uh, Kitchen Express, uh, foolishly, to, to do grocery deliveries way back in 2013. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, and then I also run a consultancy for small businesses and startups uh, called Potter and Dale, um, that did quite well, uh, you know, prior to leaving. I was also very uh, early on part of um, a group of people that came together to uh, launch a company called uh, Heal the World, right? Um, and all of those things were, were fine, great, dandy. Um, but in uh, eight years ago, when I decided I wanted to leave, it's because I wanted to, to have um, a bigger impact on the world that I was seeing. Uh, not knowing, moving to the US, right? Um, the very first thing that you start to contend with as someone who was born and lived outside of the United States is this idea of being an immigrant. Never really thought about it in any other place that I've been, right? Um, but the US is quite good at uh, helping you remember that you're an immigrant, right? It's a big part of what becomes uh, your identity. Now, when I moved here, you know, um, outside of my own experiences, the first couple of years as an immigrant and then an undocumented immigrant, um, you start to notice that other people around you are struggling and, and going through the same experience. In fact, 48 million people in the United States, right? 
um, were born or born of people who did not grow up here, right? And so it's a big part of what makes the US, um, you know, the nation that it is. Um, one of those challenges um, was how we support our families when we live here, right? You start to become more and more the person that people turn to when they need something. Mm -hmm. And that can stack up pretty quickly. So um, having gone through that experience about two years ago, my grandmother ended up getting sick um, and unfortunately dying as a result of that. But that in itself was not unique or different. It was the circumstances that led to that. So when she got sick, right, like everyone else, we just sent money, right? So she's able to go to the hospital and all of that. Now, in the midst of all of that, she chose not to go to the hospital appointment that she had, and instead going to see a herbalist, right? This happens often. Some people tell you we've been using herbs for as long as possible. Problem with that is she didn't really know what she was being given or what she even had, right? Mm -hmm. Within 24 hours, she was gone. Wow. Right? And that was the first time that I started to contend with the fact that simply having money and sending money home doesn't actually solve any of the problems, right? And so for me, it became like, how do we actually create the rails or the system that supports someone with the resources to be able to like get access to care? And, and that became the wider thing that uh, we started to look at. And so when we started Flurry, um, the challenge wasn't just around healthcare. The challenge was around for the different things that immigrants like myself were sending money home for, school fees, um, funerals, right, rents, provisions. How do we ensure that the money goes exactly where they want it to go and it mm -hmm. does what is expected of it? This is the idea behind Flurry, right? And of course, like everything else, you've got to basically chop it up in little bits and pieces and then tackle it one by one. The first vertical for us was healthcare. Why? Because 83% of people, right, would say yes if you told them the money that you need is for a health uh, emergency makes a lot of sense. And so that was our starting point. And that's where we launched a pilot to be able to actually prove this out. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for, for sharing that story. And I think that like so many founders, right? It really does start with that, that personal connection. And then like you said, truly solving a problem. And beyond that, the fact that you, you're looking at it as an opportunity to really niche. And when you do that one niche well, right? In this case, healthcare, like, you know, the, you know, the scaling, you know, opportunities are endless, right? But starting somewhere, and I love that you chose healthcare, because I think you're right, when I reflect on, you know, when other people have asked me for, you know, money, a lot of times, it's someone is sick, my mom is sick, like, I need it for this. And I think that that is one of the places where all of us, right, could, could use some support. And like you said, we're a lot more willing uh, to support in that way as well. Um, in the little conversation or chat that we had before this, you were talking about sort of one of, I don't know if you want to call it use cases or testimonials, but you sort of shared this story of, of how someone's used Flurry. Can you tell maybe, yeah, just share with everyone sort of the impact it's had? Yeah. So, you know, we've been doing this about a year and a half. Um, and in that year and a half, uh, not only have we heard a lot of stories, um, but thankfully enough, we've had the opportunity to be part of uh, the change in that narrative, right? Um, just like my story, a lot of people have gone through so many different things. People who sent money home so their fathers could be taken to the hospital, only to go home and realize that, hey, the old man got blind because the hypertension that he had was never actually taken care of, right? Um, and so an example that I give, like very recently, um, was with, you know, one of our beneficiaries in uh, Nigeria, right? So he lives in Lagos with his four children and his wife, uh, Kunle, and, you know, uh, he has his healthcare plan, 
right? And we'll later talk about like how the platform works and all of that. But he has his healthcare plan um, provided by Access. So he has a comprehensive care plan. It's an insurance plan um, provided by Axa Manset in Nigeria and sponsored by his sister-in-law, right? Mm -hmm. um, last week, Thursday, he was rushed to the hospital uh, for ruptured appendicitis or, or something like that. Um, immediately, they said, well, he's going to need surgery very soon. This is what the cost of the surgery is going to be, right? He calls um, his sister-in-law in what would usually be this frantic case of, oh, I only have three days to come up with 500,050 Naira, right? That's over $1,000, and I'm trying to get that together immediately. Now, she says, well, you do have a plan, right? Um, go get the care, right? So he goes to the hospital. Um, he gets the care that he needs. He's scheduled for uh, the surgery, right? And his plan is covering a portion of it, right? Not only that, but because he already is, um, has been on Flurry for a while, right? We're able to actually cover the initial cost of the care that goes above the plan, such that this sponsor hasn't had to do anything in the last week. She doesn't have to like run around trying to get money. No, he's gone to the surgery. He's doing well this morning, right? And now after all of that, they can think about the portion of it that they're gonna cover. This is what having security like means, right? The fact that nobody's life has changed in the last uh, five days, right? Simply because um, he fell sick or he had a ruptured uh, uh, appendix um, in, in that case. And, and that's what we're trying to bring in. People would, would get sick. That's a normal part of life, but it doesn't have to be such a life altering experience if we have the processes and the mechanisms in place to protect the people that we love. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And I think that's actually a great segue to talk a little bit more about how the product works. Because what it sounds like is that there's also sort of an element of credit that you can sort of give to people who've been on the platform for a while and you have an understanding of their habits. So yeah, please share a little bit more about the product. So that's that's a good point. And um, that's something that we're testing out um, and ties to uh, a much larger goal that uh, we, we want to be able to get to. Um, but Flurry Health by, by Flurry, right, is a, a platform that allows for immigrants to be able to find the right care plans, discover providers, um, and be able to sponsor health care access for their families back home. What does this actually mean in terms of a platform? It's made up of two parts, right? We have one part of it that's already launched, um, and it's called the Flurry Health Exchange, right? Um, it's a marketplace that aggregates on one end healthcare providers in the countries that we're active in and their care services, right, into packages. And so for the immigrant living abroad, you come on to Flurry Health, and what you're able to do is to see different categories of care, whether it's mental health, uh, comprehensive care, home health care, geriatric care, um, emergency response services, and you see all these different providers who are offering packages um, under these categories of care. Um, as um, an immigrant, you're able to go in, see the different providers and their plans and see what reviews have been written about them, people who've used them, what regions or states they cover. And based on what you know about your loved one, your budget, and the kind of care that they need, you're able to then make a selection, right? Um, and once you make a selection, you enroll them um, under this plan and we onboard um, them onto the plan. They get access to either their card, if it's virtual or a physical card, and they can start enjoying access to that care, right, under that plan. And what you realize is this has been over the last year and a half, what we've been building, a proactive way of providing the care your family needs so you have the peace of mind to go about your life. Now, what is coming up um, and what we're going to be launching soon is basically 
um, a more reactive, right, and natural way by which immigrants uh, tackle the healthcare needs, right? And what we're basically building is a way for you to be able to pay any healthcare provider anywhere on the continent right? Um, your mom needs a pair of glasses. She goes to a hospital, right? Or she goes to the optician. Um, you can just go on to Flary, find the optician that she's at and make a direct payment to uh, that optician, right? Or your mom is rushed to the hospital. They tell you she's gone to Kolibu. You can go on there, see uh, the invoice that Kolibu is giving, find Kolibu on Flary and directly make a payment there, right? The, the experience that we're building here is transparency, accountability, but most importantly, efficiency for the hard end money that you worked for, right? So now you don't have to give it to cousin Junior. Junior decides, you know, part of it should go to grandma, but part of it is for Friday night at uh, Republic. All right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for talking us through that. For those of you who are joining us, please feel free to ask questions. If you have any questions for Sam, we'll get to those towards the end. But if any questions about what he shared so far, please go ahead and use the Q&A um, component to ask. Uh, you know, I think Sam, the next question I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about um, is some of the challenges. What are some of the things that you've seen, you know, building this out over the last year and a half? Oh, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, but maybe I'll give you uh, three in, in different segments, right? So uh, that's one, the people part, right? Because I'm no superhero and neither am I like a superhuman, right? None of this is, is done by just me, right? Um, we have a pretty significant team size. There's 15 people at the company uh, working okay. on different things, right? And so it takes a lot of people to be able to do that. So the first challenge that you kind of run into is how do you build something that doesn't exist with a group of people who haven't seen it before, mm -hmm. right? Um, truth is, it takes a lot of mistakes and a lot of searching to be able to figure that out. You're going to make a lot of wrong hires. You're going to get a lot of people who are individually great, but they just suck for what you're doing, right? You're also going to meet a lot of people who are like amazing human beings, but this is just not the right fit. Uh, for for them, right? And so it will be very frustrating should they keep going um, in, in this. Also, you're going to need to evolve to be able to accommodate um, first uh, being a big evangelist of your dream to being mm -hmm. someone who um, supports and reinforces um, other people to be able to build out that dream. How do you get a group of people to be as passionate about something that you've been dreaming about and excited about and know the insights of, right? And even think of like what the future of it could look like. It's really, really tricky to do, right? Couple that with the fact that um, we started a company um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I was doing something else. I was a co-founder at, at another company, right? And having to make the decision, okay, hmm, it's a pandemic. There's less money to go around. People are having to stay home and you are actively choosing to leave the company that is kind of figured out to go do something new, right? All of a sudden, you're compounding all of these situations, right? And then, we had a baby right at the beginning of that. So that's just something else. I have a company and a newborn, right? Um, you know, and then you take the ridiculous story of the fact that I actually I'm in the military. So now I have like a third thing to think about, right? So those are all like different challenges that you don't necessarily start up having access to, but you're like, okay. I think this could work. Let's figure it out a day at a time. But you need amazing people around you, right? Including, uh, you know, my spouse who helps with a lot of this stuff, right? Um, that's one challenge. And then there's also the people that you're actually building for. So for the past 70 plus years, um, people have mostly been sending money for every bloody thing under the sun, right? Need a haircut? All right, I'll send you some $10, all 
Um, you want to go to uh, the club? Okay, I'll send you $50 to push you. It's your birthday. I'm going to send you money. How do you tell someone who's been sending in money forever that, hey, there might be a better way to do this? Why don't you just pay for the stuff? Uh, do I trust you? Is this another scam? What do you know about it? Magana Kra, do they even have insurance companies? What do those insurance plans look like? Oh, and you can bring a nurse to my mother's house to come and take care of her. What if the nurse comes to steal her stuff, right? All of these different things that people have, right? And you're gonna have to build credibility. You're gonna have to build trust, right? And you're gonna have to get people on your side to believe in this. All of that is pretty hard. Right. In addition to that, you're going to have to raise money because you need to be able to finance the stuff that you want to build because it doesn't exist and other people aren't doing it. Right. How do you put all of that together? Raising money sucks. Don't let anybody tell you different. Right. Um, you're trying to get people to believe in a vision of something that doesn't exist and believe that not only can you get it done, but other people will believe that you can get it done and do it well enough for them to pay money for it. Pretty like daunting when you think about all of those different things that you gotta deal with. Um, so there's no shortage of like challenges. Um, there's just a day at a time and trying to figure out like who's gonna help me get this done? Who's gonna help me do it? And like, do I believe in myself to be able to do it, right? And then when you leave all of that stuff, there's like the personal shit that you got to deal with, right? Um, like a ton of them. I probably gained like 100 pounds, right, uh, in the last two years because you're working ridiculous hours. I barely get up from behind my computer. Or you're going to stand up and do like a standing desk thing. Like right? it is not easy. It's just so many different things. And all for the price of being able to someday, right, live life on your own terms. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing openly um, and vulnerably about some of the challenges that you've dealt with. And I think one of the things that I really appreciate about what you've shared is that you've sort of, you know, given people a lens into what it's like being a founder, right? So in addition to thinking about your own habits, your own routines, right? That's something that you're also thinking about for those who are going to use your products. And I don't think people think about that so much, right? If you're building a new app, a new way of doing something, you're having to break a habit that they already have, right? Especially in terms of paying for things and showing them something that's new and different. So just really appreciate you sharing that perspective. And I think this question actually from one of the participants is, I think, closely related to this concept of challenges. And as you shared that, your your product is now you know going to be expanding into five different uh, countries. Can you share a little bit more about how you've dealt with some of the institutional frameworks with these different countries? Um, because every single one has different policies and different rules. Uh, so so how do you consider that, or how have you navigated that over the last year and a half? Yeah. So like with regards to this, this is like a, a big thing that people think about a lot, right? Um, do you go deep or do you go wide? Um, do you just focus on one small country and try to get it right? Um, or uh, when is the right time for you to go to a different country? Um, for me, it's always been an easy choice, right? Um, I, I had a pretty great Pan-African education. Um, I, I did college in Morocco. I probably went to school with someone from every African country and then some. Um, and so when I think of like Africa, I really don't think of Ghana. Um, I think of, you know, all of the different places where my kids were born or like the places that I've lived, right? Um, and so it was never really a choice. Um, the continent is big. There's a lot of opportunity. And the one thing we're building for, for Africa is it's such a hard job getting to like growth scale because people are so skeptical um, and there's so many other things that you're dealing with that what you're going to get in the initial stages is pockets of wins, right, in different places. And you need to be able to have enough collective wins to be able to build momentum and significant scale. 
right? So that's the reality of what is like building like on the continent. But then there's the other side of like, how do you deal with like Kenya or understand what's going on in Nigeria, right, enough? So one, I travel a lot. Two, I know a lot of people. Right. So I went to school with a ton of people. I have relationships in a lot of places. Um, and that helps. Right. Because at the end of the day. We're, we're all people and it takes good people to be able to do anything. Um, but the best part about being a founder who's building for emerging markets and building for Africa in particular is because there are a ton of people who are also trying to build out different things and they're always so willing to be able to help. They have the insights, they know what you need to do and what you don't need to do. And that's a big part of it. Um, having a network that helps you navigate, is super important to being able to do this, right? Because um, no, it doesn't exist in any book. And two, regulations, um, as you will come to find out about Africa, is one thing what the law says, and then there's actually what the convention is. Right. And you need people who help you figure out what the convention is, because um, the law says differently and it works in a different way. And the realities on the ground are only interpreted through people. And it's all about relationships. Right. Um, that's a big part about how we operate and how we look at all these different markets. Um, that's that's really the, the reality of how we approach this. That's, that's just amazing, Sam, and I think it's a great segue actually for a question I wanted to ask you, because one of the things I noted is that you are or have been a part of some amazing accelerators, incubators, communities. I also saw that you're Harambian. I'm also Harambian. So yeah. can you tell us maybe about some of the groups that you've been a part of, some of the communities you've been a part of, and, and how they've supported you on your journey? Yeah, so this this kind of like reinforces um, again um, the the focus on the networks that you're building, right? Uh, you need like-minded people, just like any significant movement. We also have a very globally distributed team, right? So we have employees in all of these different countries um, who are doing different things right and helping us because you need on the ground presence to be able to react to the realities of the things that are happening so the networks is a, is a start is a, is a start right so the haramian community is fairly distributed and you can find help wherever you need it um, and then there's tech stars right that has several other entrepreneurs who've gone through these experiences and some of these entrepreneurs are from the same countries that we're either operating in or want to get into right um, and then that the relationships that you build as you travel and you go to school and you meet different places, right? And then also the events that you go to, like Collision, Web Summit, right? All of these things come together to kind of make the bigger world a much, much smaller places, uh, a place to, to be. Because we move at the speed of our connections, right? And the more connections you have, the faster you move, right? The shorter your learning curve, right? Uh, the shorter your access to opportunity, right? So relationships is like the currency on which the world operates. And the more of them that you have, um, the more quality the relationships that you have, it's the difference between the Ghana city and the US dollar, right? It, it's it's a currency and it trades in the same way um, and you use it the, the same way. Yeah, and I think, you know, what you're speaking to also, I think is the value of being part of, right? A community like even, you know, Founders Institute, right? The fact that, you know, similar to Techstars, it's global, right? These are all people who are, you know, going through a similar thing. You have access to mentors, you have access to, you know, alumni, all of those elements make it, um, easier to fundraise. And so we actually have a few questions that have come through around fundraising. So can you tell us a little bit about your fundraising journey? Um, and if you have any advice for startups who are looking to raise? Yeah, so um, uh, for when it comes to like 
fundraising, right? Uh, it's tough by any measure. Um, it's even harder when you're trying to convince, um, when you're trying to convince a group of people um, to invest in the space that like they just don't see. And to kind of give you that, I, I used to get a little bit miffed right when um, back in 2020 we started talking to uh, different investors and you know they're like okay you're trying to build this thing and why don't they just send money right it's like but that's exactly the point because it doesn't make sense right communicating your vision um, it's really, really tough. And you've got to like get it clear. You've got to do it over and over and over and over and pitch and pitch and pitch and pitch. But what that is doing is getting you enough reps to be able to understand like how it's hitting and what people are thinking of it because your market is reacting to what you're saying. Your market is reacting to the information. And it might all seem like a lot of heavy lifting right, before anything happens. But trust me, nobody's success out there is overnight, right? It's tons of work that nobody sees, right, before you get to a point where people see. And it's the same thing with fundraising. You're going to have to hear a lot of no's until you hear a couple of yeses, right? And it's those yeses that at the end matter, not the no's, but you still have to get through them to be able to get to the yeses um, in that way. And, and it teaches you, that process of fundraising teaches you um, a little bit about yourself and a lot about what you're building and how the world sees it, right, um, in, in a way. Because, you know, let's forget the hype. Largely, capital goes where there is, you know, commitment and connection and um, promise, right? When people want something, then it becomes easier for people to want to fund it, which is like the stupid paradox of fundraising. The less you need money, the more money wants to come to you. Okay. Can't figure that one out. Thank you so much for that, Sam. And I think, you know, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your team. Do you have any co-founders and who's supporting you on this journey? Yeah, I have found in, um, you know, colleagues and, and teammates. Um, I don't have co-founders, not for the lack of trying, right? Um, it's really tough when you start out bootstrapping, right? So you start out with a number of people and um, you hope that everybody can go the journey. But um, when you're not making any money and you don't have any money and you're hustling, um, that's a really tough time to be able to get other people like involved. And so um, it wasn't until we we raised um, our first round of like friends and family and like our first investor was Founders Factory, right? Uh, Rue Rogers, Sam Stern, um, they took that bet, right? So we couldn't hire anybody. I had uh, an intern, um, Sadiq, who started with us. Um, and then one person was posting on social media, um, Abna, who today uh, leads our family care unit, right, working with the beneficiaries, right? Um, that was all we could afford, and that was coming out of my pocket, right? Um, and then you you raise, and like you want to be super careful about how much you're spending and all of that. So um, everything that we are is because of the amazing team that we have, right? And they're everywhere. We have folks in Ghana, we've hired in the Philippines, we've hired in uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, Venezuela, we've hired in uh, South Africa, we've hired in uh, Rwanda, right? Kenya, uh, Ghana, right? Um, because we're building for a very diverse set of people. And you need people who understand that uh, to be able to deliver on that, right? Um, so yeah, it, it takes amazing team members um, who believe and want to work towards uh, building a future to be able to do it. And just to follow up on that, do you think the fact that you're a sole founder has had an impact on your ability to raise funds? I don't think about it. I, I don't think about it, um, to be honest, I don't. Um, if, if there was ever a problem for anybody too bad for them, um, I don't think about it, uh, not much, right? Because 
just because you have two heads uh, doesn't necessarily mean things come out any better. It, it just means more time having arguments anyway. Um, but skills are complementary. Um, my, my belief is that those skills aren't just tied to, to a title, right? Those skills are existent regardless. Um, and it's about finding the right people, whether or not they're co-founders or, or not. Um, also, experience makes a big difference, right? So this is not my first or second or third company, right? And so after a while, you realize that um, a lot of your early lessons are learned. Um, and so you just want to get right down to the building and to the tough parts. So you're much rather focused on, hey, how do I get to this point and who do I need to get me to that point? And how do I compensate them uh, properly, right? Rather than, hey, how do I find someone who wants to hustle it out with me? And then somehow we're going to figure it out. I think there's a lot less of, you know, uh, the figuring out um, and a lot more about the intentional building. And, and you need really good uh, qualified uh, people to be able to do that. Thank you so much for that, Sam. I think everyone probably has different ideas or a lot of different investors have different ideas of whether or not you need a co-founder or you do need one. So it's always great to hear the perspective of someone who's done this multiple times. For those of you who are listening, if you have any questions, please, please uh, let us know in the Q&A because we will be wrapping up soon. Um, I'm loving the next question that actually just came in. And I actually think I would like to do that before we get into more the more specific question that we had earlier. So, you know, Sam, we actually talked a little bit about this before, um, you know, we went live, but as a founder, there are a lot of things that you need to deal with as it can impact your mental health. Do you experience this and how do you stay focused and energized? Thank you so much for that question. Ah, um, we talked about this. Yeah. So yeah I'm glad that like, we were able to slip it in. You, you don't always stay focused and energized. That's just the truth. Right. Um, you know. You know, there's a guy that says he works 19 hours a day and he barely gets any sleep and, and he's doing all of that and he can run multiple companies and, and that's great, right? But the truth is, most of us can do that, right? Um, I don't sleep much. That's terrible, but I don't sleep much. That's just the reality. Uh, some people tell you they can't function without eight hours of sleep. Um, that's them. Um, I barely get three hours of sleep or four hours of sleep, right? Um, but that also has an effect. Uh, it means you're living a poor quality of life, right? That's just the reality. But I would do anything for what I'm building. Um, and that's just the reality for anybody that wants to take this on. Um, sometimes you're just not in the right space of mind. I mean, you've got family to deal with. Um, you're not rich as a startup founder, far from it, right? You're highly underpaid, especially as a founder that is building for emerging markets. It's just the reality. You're not paying yourself a ton of money, right? Because you need to be like cash, uh, you need to be like super efficient with, with the money that you're spending. And so your personal life is gonna be a reflection of a lot of choices. And sometimes you don't have a lot of that. Um, Work-life balance, no, non-existent, right? I don't believe in it. I've never had it. I don't have it. I don't see when I'm going to have it, right? Because it just isn't true. Um, you have someone in Nigeria that wants to talk in the morning. It's 10 a.m. there. It's like, I don't know what, 5 a.m. for me. Um, yeah, I'm going to show up on that call because that engineer wants to talk through something that's a blocker for them. Um, guess what? I'm going to be talking to someone who is in Rwanda. And one, I'm asking them to get on the phone at 10 p.m., right? Um, and it sucks, but that's how we've got to get this done. And it takes a toll on you. Um, you might gain weight. You will feel depressed sometimes. Uh, you might not have a lot of people who really understand the choice that you're making, right? People are going out. Um, no, there's not a lot of that for you to do. But there's also the other side, right, which we've got to talk about. Like, um, sometimes the things that you live for, right, like you go to Kenya, and Kenya is a huge party town, 
right? Like it's a, it's a huge party country. And when you're in Nairobi, you realize that people like to have fun. Part of building the relationships with them is you've got to make time to connect outside of the office. It always doesn't happen on your timeline, right? You've got to have multiple parts of your personality that feed into that. Because the way that you chat and the way that you build relationships and the way that you have fun has as much of an effect on the relationships that are important to the things that you're building as your ability to be able to keep a straight face and do the calculations that you need to do and drive the growth that you need to drive. So um, it just takes a lot to be able to do that. And you're constantly shifting between these different like personalities or these different requirements of you and your time and the decisions that you have to make that like there really isn't a rule book. You're gonna make it up yourself um, and whatever works for you and gets you to your goal, that's what works, right? Not what the other person said on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> for that, Sam. Thank you so much for sharing more about your experience. Um, so some additional questions uh, that are coming from the amazing audience. Thank you all so much for sharing these. Please keep them coming. Uh, we'd love to know a little bit more about how you make money. Can you take us a little bit deeper into your business model? Yeah, um, you wouldn't exist much if you didn't make money. Yeah, you might not make money in the beginning, but you definitely have to know how you want to make money. Um, so Flurry's model has um, grown over time, right? Uh, when we started, we just wanted to prove out one thing in the pilot, right? So we had a pilot that was focused on Ghana, and later on it expanded into Nigeria, right? Um, the merits of it was pretty simple. We wanted to prove that people could pay directly for care plans. And we started with just the insurance part of it. They could pay for the insurance and have their family member have it and they will get peace of mind. And for doing that, we charged the insurance company a platform fee, right, to work with us, right? And that was how we made money. Um, our model is a little bit more mature now. Um, the Flurry Health Exchange, right, um, is one way by which we make money. And we make money on two sides of it. There's the margin, which is composed in the final amount that the immigrant pays. And then there's the platform fee, which is a percentage of what the company, whether it's an insurance company or it's a mental health care uh, company, that provider, right, uh, pays as a platform fee to be on the exchange. Right. And so those two ways is how we make money um, in the future. As we go on, there's like transactions that are coming and a percentage of that uh, for being able to facilitate those transactions as we build the rails. So that's what our business model looks like for Flurry Health. Right. There are a few other things that we're getting into um, and those have uh, very different business models as well uh, as, as we build out the entire platform. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Sam. And I think that this next question is somewhat um, adjacent. So this really is around trust. So there's a lot of issues of rolling out insurance products due to the lack of trust by consumers in, ins you know, in insurance companies. How do startups, including yours, ensure this trust is built um, and nurtured, retained when it's still some of the same, you know, big insurance companies backing them? Yeah, so the important thing to note is Flurry is not an insurance company. We do not intend to be an insurance company. Um, also, insurance is one eighth of what we do on our platform, right? Um, when you get into the health exchange, you have different categories of care. Not all of them is insurance. In fact, the majority are not. So you take, for instance, um, we work with a provider partner called um, ERA, Emergency Response Africa, right? It's run by a wonderful Ghanaian and a Nigerian, uh, Falake and Mami. Um, and they, they both are based in Canada, but operate um, out of uh, Nigeria and they are often on the continent. Um, Emergency Response Africa has one mission, to create products and services that allow people to be able to deal with medical emergencies, whether it is in dispatching a paramedic or dispatching an ambulance, right? When you get on Flurry, 
and you purchase an emergency response plan for your family in Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt, what you're essentially doing is subscribing to a plan that ensures that should they run into an emergency, they have prioritized access to a private ambulance and emergency response service, right? That has nothing to do with insurance, right? It's just a healthcare service that covers them in the case of an emergency, right? We also have elderly care plans, right, that are provided by partners, right? So in Ghana, we have a company called Express Med that we work with, their provider partner. Express Med does a number of things. They can either dispatch a doctor that goes to your home to take care of your mother on a regular basis, on a one-time basis, right? But they also have nurses that take care of the elderly, either on a 12-hour basis, half day, or they would actually live with them and take care of them on a 24 hour basis. This has nothing to do with insurance, right? It's a service that you get for a nurse being home, taking care of your grandfather or your grandmother. Um, and so Flurry is focused on building the platform and the rails and the opportunity for you to find the right care plan right, for that loved one that you have. It is not for us to sell your insurance. If the right care plan for you is a comprehensive insurance plan from say uh, nationwide medical insurance, then great. That is what you're going to pick because that solves the problem for you. But for us, we're really the software layer, right? And the service partner that organizes all of this to deliver a smooth experience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sam. And I'm just curious, sort of a follow up to that and just even reflecting on my own experience within, you know, the startup space, when there is an issue with, you know, an insurance provider, do you find that the people who are purchasing these plans on behalf of their family members come to you or do they recognize that they're going to the insurance? And I think that's kind of yeah. where the, the question is coming from, right? Recognizing that, you know, you're providing this. And so do they, you know, how does that work? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I can tell you what um, the experience actually doing this is, is like. Mm -hmm. no, no matter what um, you tell them or what they see or the fact that a service is delivered by a provider that they end up choosing, they trust us to be able to intervene and deal with everything. And okay. that is exactly what the expectation that we set with them. It's, it's why we exist. We exist to hold that provider accountable for the service they said they'll be providing to you. And if they don't live up to that, then bye-bye. They've got to go, right? It's exactly that. It's like going on Airbnb and deciding to book a place. And then you go have a racist experience in that home. Airbnb kicks uh, the, the, the homeowner off of their platform right, and works with you to be able to find what the right measure is. In some cases, it could be reimbursing someone for the situation that they've been in, and we've been in this a lot of times, right? Someone goes to um, a hospital that is on the provider network for one of our health insurance partners, right? Now, when they get there, um, they tell them, oh, we're having system issues, so we can't recognize that you're an actual paid member, right? They get pissed, they go to another provider that's able to provide them with the service. Now they come back to you and they say, well, it's not my fault, right? This provider did not provide the service at the time that it was needed. For them, all they care about is, hey, you gotta make it right. Mm -hmm. For us, all we care about is, let us first take care of your mom, or you, and let's solve that. And sometimes that means reimbursing them upfront and going to deal with that insurer um, later on, right? Because the one thing that we have, it's our platform. That insurer gets paid through us and we have the ability to work with them to be able to find the right experience. This solves a lot of the challenges around, you know, trust and efficiency and um, experience in our local markets, right? When you take insurance as a category, we have such a low insurance penetration, let alone a, uh, an even lower health insurance penetration rate, 
And this is largely because of the experiences that have been delivered. What Flurry does is for people who live outside, we make sure that they don't have to deal with all of that craziness. We make sure we only work with partners who understand that delivering world-class service is the goal and we only work with them to be able to resolve that. So you'll never feel alone. You'll never have to go actually deal with nationwide or Clico. No, you'll never have to do that. Uh, there's always gonna be a dedicated uh, family rep who's working with you to resolve any of that. And there's always gonna be a dedicated advocate who's working with you to ensure that everything is sorted out. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sam. And we have one last question before we wrap up here. Um, so this is a bit of a compound question is in relation or, you know, it's related to a specific uh, career site that this individual is building. Um, so with the, the first part of the question, we actually already answered, but uh, I will just sort of share the question in its entirety. So the first part of the question was, which African countries are you in? I'm currently building a website, so it's a career site, but I've chosen to focus on Sub-Saharan Africa and not include North Africa. I've chosen to sacrifice, and they put it in quotes, the North so I can focus on Francophone Africa, which seems to be overlooked by Anglo-speaking African apps. What are your thoughts on this? I think that's great. The money is always in the niches, right? Uh, did we um want to do money transfers no do people ask why don't you transfer money yep they ask all the time but we don't right we're not going to transfer money um there are 4800 and plus right people who do that you have no shortage of choices right um we want to solve a problem and there's a big enough market to solve that problem same for him um a lot of the time one of the mistakes that we make is thinking Oh, Ghana, Nigeria, that's about it. No, no, uh, DRC is a huge country um, that is growing. Um, Cameroon, Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, that's like a ton of opportunity. And the interesting thing is these markets are way more systematized sometimes than we even find in you know, the West African countries that we look at. Uh, from that standpoint. And so, no, you're not doing it wrong at all. Um, you recognize the niche that you want to go over, go focus on that. Um, North Africa is not an easy place to work from, right? Um, not only are their governments a lot more strict on how business is done, Right, but you often will need like a local partner and so many other things to do, right? Because those markets are a lot more mature, right? In that way, the opportunity is in the thousands of markets that have not seen the level of focus, attention, penetration. And, you know, you get to be one of the earlier ones rather than, you know, being in all of the popular. Uh, markets. Um, and then the other question is, what countries are we in? We're in Ghana, we're in Nigeria, we're in Zambia, we're in Zimbabwe, and very soon we're going to be in Kenya. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sam. And maybe for the last question to just wrap us up um, is, what are you excited about next? What's coming next for you, maybe personally, and also for your business? Uh, personally, what am I excited about? Um, I'm excited about you know, being able to live on the continent again, super excited about that. Um, I have a countdown that goes um, in, in my head um, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, on the business side, what am I excited about? I'm excited about something that we're building um, that, that really changes the way that, you know, people have always supported their families. Like that's, that's the biggest part, right? Um, that excites me at the possibility of being able to help, you know, my aunt keep more money in her pocket because she doesn't have to dish out money for every single thing, right? Um, that's what excites me. It's just creating more opportunity for immigrants to win, right? By helping them keep more money in their pockets. Amazing. And if people were interested in finding more about you and what you do, where can they find you? Well, I'm on Twitter. I'm not very active, but um, Ghana Boy Sam on Twitter. You'll find me there. Uh, what's up, Simon? 
Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, I'm on LinkedIn. Those are pretty much the only two that I can manage. Like my capacity for social media is super limited and I need to like recharge um, every so often. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, you can find Flurry at Flurry Global um, on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, um, YouTube, right? So yeah, we're, we're all there. And if you live stateside in Canada, we'll probably be in like in a church or in a community gathering um, near you, so. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Sam, for your time, for your energy, and for your thoughts, and just being so open with sharing about your experience and building out this amazing product. Those of you who joined us this evening, thank you also very much as well for joining us and for all your amazing questions. If you are interested, of course, I have to do the little plug uh, for uh, Founders Institute Ghana, right? If you are interested in joining us, please keep in mind that the deadline for enrollment is August 21st, and we get started with our cohort on August 30th. So really, really excited again to have you, Sam. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you very much uh, for, for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to be a part of this. All right. Thank you again. And for those of you joining us, from West Africa or most of Sub-Saharan Africa. Have a good evening. And Sam, have a great afternoon. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Sam. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye.